We are honored to have you here. Um, learners, uh, I will be asking you a little bit later if you'd like to share a little bit about your projects and if you have any questions for Guy, but uh, I'll give you time to uh, get those thoughts together. Guy, why don't you start out by um, telling us what what your approach is, and then and specifically, we've been talking this week about um, about organizational and strategic uh, needs analysis versus competency analysis. And I know you okay. worked in both the, both of those areas. Maybe you can share your approaches. Sure. Uh, so all of our language is really uh, interesting in that it can mean so many different things and does mean so many different things. So um, I have I was not uh, educated in um, learning and development or training and development. I have a radio, TV, film degree. I entered into the training organization, becoming a program developer, writing scripts for a video department that would produce in video based instruction. Um, but uh, so uh, let's see, can I share my screen? Yeah. Yep. That looks great. All right. So as I said, it was a derivative of a derivative of Geary Rumler's approach to instructional analysis. And, and I've been using this approach since 1979. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. So I, I'm going to share with uh, Diane this uh, PowerPoint show. So you don't have to worry about taking copious notes or anything. But uh, so I have a series of questions that I asked to get after both performance and gaps. And what we do is we first, when we're looking at performance, this is my approach. So, so we'll talk about how this needs to be adjusted for your needs. But when I go in and look at individual performance, a process performance, a department's worth of performance, really the first thing we need to do is kind of segment that uh, those chunks of performance into what I call areas of performance, but they're also known as major duties, key results areas, accomplishments. Again, many different labels for this notion of doing kind of a work breakdown structure. So if you're familiar with ADDIE, ADDIE is an, a set of areas of performance. There's analysis, which is different than design, which is different than development, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's the nature of this. And so then for each one of the areas of performance, which again is just a segment of the overall performance, um, we can begin to look at the ideal performance, and we can begin to look at then uh, the gap performance. So um, let me move into a bigger screen view of this. So my focus on performance, what I learned on day one was to look at outputs. People are on the payroll to produce outputs. They're not there to know stuff. They're not there to perform tasks. They're all of those things, knowing things and being able to perform tasks is a means to the ends of producing outputs, physical, tangible outputs and intangible outputs. And those outputs are usually inputs downstream to some other set of processes or whatever. And both the outputs and the tasks have stakeholders. So I can use this, this look at performance at the people level, at the processes level or teams level, at the organizational level, at the enterprise level and the value chain that each and every uh, enterprise is a part of. Um, well, we first look at ideal performance and we can begin to identify what are the key outputs in this. You know, if you're doing analysis versus design and development, when you're doing analysis, what is it that you produce? Well, there's a whole series of outputs that are produced in an analysis effort. But so you can begin to identify each and every one of those outputs, and then you can identify, well, what are the key measures? What are the stakeholder requirements for that output? And you can capture that. Then you can begin to identify all of the tasks per output. This is how I've approached analysis my entire career find the output or outputs, identify the measure for each, identify the task set for each of those. And this is trying to capture this at the ideal level. So if you've got master performers, top performers, star performers, 
What levels of performance are they operating at? Those measures, what standards are they meeting? If there's a time requirement, cycle time is a requirement. If some people are doing it in five minutes, but others are doing it in three, well, three then is the standard because it can be done at three. And can we get everybody else that's doing it at five minutes closer to three minutes and speed and accelerate our performance? Once we've captured all of that, we can begin to look at the gap performance and you can look at the language here. So I do this by looking at, okay, we've got these outputs and these measures. Are all of these measures always met by everybody all of the time? Well, yes or no is the answer. And so we can get people to identify, well, we have a problem with this first measure here. A lot of people don't meet that measure when they produce that output and it requires you know, rejection or rework or whatever. And we can begin to identify, so what, so what is that performance, typical performance gap, some gap where we're not meeting the measure, we can articulate that. And we can then identify, well, what are some of the probable gap causes? And if we have a lot of time, we can actually get down to de determining what are the root causes, probable cause versus root cause. That's my weasel word for I don't have all the time in the world as I'm doing this analysis. I want to quickly capture this information. And if we need to circle back and dig deeper, we can. But so that's why I'm using that word uh, probable instead of root uh, gap cause. And so I can, if there may be more than one uh, gap per measure issue and a set of gap causes. And so these are where we're identifying what are the gaps. Well, there's another part of gap analysis, and that's looking at for each one of the probable gap causes, are some of them due to a deficiency of the process itself? We can't fix that with training. Is it a deficiency of the environmental enablers? People have bad data or bad tools. We can't fix that with training. Um, deficiency of knowledge and skill? Oh, we can fix that with instruction, training, or learning. And a deficiency of the individual's attributes and values? Um, we cannot necessarily fix that with training. People are who they are. I only have so much stamina before I wear out, and maybe the job requires more than that. So that's the idea here between the data. This is some performance analysis data done in 1986 for sales representatives. And you can see the typical deficiencies, deficiency causes, DEDK. Now, I'm an instructional designer, a learning experience designer. And so my projects are always, always about developing instruction. But what I'm trying to do, uh, adding my performance uh, lens to all of this, is that if there are gaps in performance, well, training isn't going to fix that. Instruction isn't going to fix that. Learning is not going to fix that. And so I think it's just as important that we identify where instruction, training, learning isn't going to be adequate to the needs of our clients as it is to address that well when we do find that a situation that requires learning. Um, and so part of my goal is to help my clients improve performance. And if instruction to address knowledge and skills is part of that, then so be it. So I always uh, develop these kinds of things in a facilitated group process where I bring together master performers, other subject matter experts, supervisors, uh, novice performers sometimes, and generate this kind of data. Uh, the data has to be valid and it has to be credible. We should talk about that in a little bit. So here's another one. This is sales job done, done in 93. Been doing this again, like I said, for a long time. Typical deficiencies, probable causes, whether it's a DE, DK, DI. This helps me build ownership with my clients and their top performers what the performance requirements are, what are the gaps, and will training or instruction be able to address those gaps? And I need to help build uh, some understanding across the people that I'm working with um, to make sure that they understand that there's things that we won't be able to address with training. This is something that was done in the early 2000s for Verizon in my offices back in Chicago when I had them. Um, and you can see the charts that we put up on the wall here in the team from Verizon that work with three of my people in this picture here to do that. So there's always, we're always focused on the gaps. This is from 2004. Again, typical performance gaps, probable gap causes, whether this is a deficiency of the environment, knowledge and skills of the performers, or other individual attributes and values. Um, 
So, guys, so, did did you uh, from from listening to you and seeing just that picture is is a primary way that you did this kind of getting a focus group? And you mentioned of you know supervisors and and performers, some novices. You get them in a room and you kind of do the you know you fill the wall with these charts. Exactly. Uh, I've been doing this this way. We, we, we wrote articles for the uh, NSPI, the ISPI journal back in 1984 on how to do analysis using a group process. And we published an article in 1984 in Training Magazine on how to do design using a group process. So I believe in the power of uh, facilitating groups of experts, people who know the job inside and out, uh, people who understand certain aspects of the job, but don't do the job. So that's the difference between master performers and other subject matter experts. And sometimes we bring in supervisors and sometimes we bring in novice performers. And there's, so there's a mix of players here and we're really looking to capture the voice of the master performers about what is ideal performance look like and where are the gaps in current state performance. For those people who aren't master performers, where are they missing the boat? And why is that? Because that's what we're trying to dig after, because we're going after trying to improve performance. We may produce some instruction, some learning, but that's never been my goal. My goal has always been to help my clients improve performance. And if the whole thing doesn't require any training at all, then I pack up my bags and go back home. Um, but anyway, so that so this is the root of the performance aspect of my analysis and there's and then there we would then use that data to systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills we could look at all those charts and and ask the experts who do the job for a living what company policies procedures practices and guidelines do you need to comply with when you're doing that work and there either are some or there aren't or what laws regulations codes and agreements and contracts do you have to comply with when you're doing those tasks to produce those outputs. What industry standards might you use? What internal organizations, external organizations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I systematically tease out all of the enabling knowledge and skills based on this understanding of performance and both the ideal performance and the gap performance because sometimes the causes of the gaps cause my analysis teams and design teams to think a little bit deeper about the situation to determine what is really going on here. What we're often trying to do is to elicit the non-conscious knowledge, the automated knowledge, the tacit knowledge that people don't readily know. And some of that's difficult, if not impossible, because people have automated so much of what they know in terms of how to do their jobs that they don't even think about it. It's just automatic. And so we're yeah. always looking to try to pull those kinds of things out. So my goal is always to get my client to the end of the analysis phase to what I call the L&D pivot point so that I can inform their decision-making process to continue with instruction, training, and learning, or to stop and pivot to some non-instructional intervention or to do both because that often happens. Um, and the uh, the gap data helps the clients also prioritize where do we want to focus any instruction or learning on before we go into design and then we can go do that. So uh, we have a couple of sure. we have a couple of questions here. Um, Timothy, you want to uh, turn on your microphone and you can you can ask your questions. Um, thanks. The first question I just had is how do you get buy-in from everyone? Because um, when you described your analysis. You were looking at key performers versus non-key performers, but in a focus group, um, there are some people that are going to be very vocal and some people that are going to just, you know, be a part of the group. So how do you get buy-in? That was just the first question. And then the other part of the question was, um, how often, how do you know when you've achieved all the gaps or you've gotten to that point where all the gaps have been addressed or is there a point? Yeah, there is. It's usually when people go silent and they run out of things to say. Now, that doesn't mean that we've run out of the real gaps that exist. We've just simply exhausted the assembled group's knowledge, their collective knowledge of the situation, and they can't think of any more. But that doesn't mean that when we're not working on the next part of analysis, that they won't think about that and want to go back and amend that 
earlier flip chart happens all the time. Getting buy-in from the group. Um, so yeah, so the, the groups have to be selected carefully. I when I work as a consultant, I'm working on high stakes performance, not low stakes stuff. And there's a lot of low stakes stuff that we work on. And I ask my clients to hand pick my sources, the master performers and the subject matter experts, uh, et cetera, that will, will assemble in a team effort. If I can use a team effort, I'm not always able to do that. And it's really all about the data rather than the method you do that. But but it's quicker and faster. You generate better data in a in a team approach. But but the facilitators got to bring people out. So if I said, you know, Timothy, you've been quiet for a while here. You haven't said anything about what the group has said in here. And uh, um, Diane just said something a few minutes ago. And, you know, what do you agree? And, uh, you know, so then I can bring people in. So it's really up to the facilitator to do face polling, watch the faces of the people in the group, make sure that they're tracking, that they're with you. You know, I tell groups that I'm doing face polling. I'm looking in your faces. You can give me a clue okay, to whether you agree or not. Nod your head yes, up and down for yes, sideways for no, and diagonal for you're not sure. And we can laugh about it and then talk about this because I want the group to own the data that we generate. I never want to own it. I mean, how could I okay. own it? I don't do the job for a living. I can't describe the outputs and the and the requirements and all the tasks and et cetera, et cetera, and all the gaps and causes. So I'm creating a consensus set of data, uh, and I'm hoping that the data is going to be accurate and complete and appropriate. And what I know from my years of experience and what some of the research that's come out on this is that, you know, the data is going to be incomplete for sure because of the non-conscious nature of knowledge. And so that's what makes it trickier. But do I have it well enough to move forward into my next step. When I do analysis in the analysis phase, some people are surprised to hear me talk about that when I get into the design phase, I'm continuing to do analysis. And when I get into my development phase, I'm continuing to do analysis. So analysis is central and you can either try to boil the ocean for a cup of tea at the very beginning at a certain point okay. in your project, or you spread your analysis efforts out and get it just, just in time. You can avoid analysis paralysis by doing analysis in a kind of a spreading it out over time, over the duration of your project, um, rather than trying to get it all at once. And I've seen a lot of people fail and get trapped because they don't know, one, what data they're going to get, what they need to get. And so they're scrambling and they don't know when to move off of analysis and into design. And that's unfortunate, but they're, they're just not sure what data do I need? Well, I know what my downstream design and development processes need from me at the analysis stage. So I know what data I need and, and I don't need to get extraneous data that I'm never going to use downstream. Many of you probably have seen projects that generate data that after it's been generated, it's never used. Well, I decided to strip all of that stuff out of my approach to instructional design back in 1982 when I became a consultant. So, Guy, that I want to I want to reinforce what you just said. You know, one of the major texts we're using is Alison Rossett's uh, First Things Fast. And I point out to everybody that fast word, you know, that she put that in the title of her book for a reason. And, you know, it's a book about doing analysis but it's it's about getting off the dime too, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, and and one of the things that I found, and I'm sure you have found, you can get a group of people in a room, and then they can start going off on something. They, you know, they get caught up in something, and they start complaining about some other factor or somebody they don't like or some policy they don't like or the coffee's bad or, you know, God knows what, right? And so it can start getting you off task to other things that might be important, but it's not what you are being called in to do. Yeah. You so that's the job of the facilitator is to maintain that focus. Now, when I've trained facilitators in my methodology for my clients or my own staff, I would always team them up. So it'd be the buddy system. Um, because somebody's got to make sure that we're not drifting, that we're centered. And this is the beauty of when you're focused on performance, you can say, 
Do you produce a storyboard? Yes or no? Well, you do. Okay, now let's start there and focus on storyboarding. And other people might say, oh, they've got a war story about a bad ex war, uh, storyboarding experience and somebody's got a good one or whatever. So we can get all these distractions, but we're really trying to figure out, you know, what is that output storyboard? How do you know a good one from a bad one? What are the steps to producing? What are the tasks performed? And 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 then we, then we can begin to, well, what do you need to know in order to be able to do. But but this whole notion of being able to go fast is critical. And for 44 years here, most of the industry in my from my perspective has been going about it doing it slow. And therefore their clients don't let them do it anymore because it takes too darn long and they don't see any value out of it. And they see a lot of data that's generated and then never used again. So pretty people pretty much put the kibosh on doing analysis because it doesn't add any value. And unfortunately, that's been too true too often. And so how we do analysis is one aspect of this, what we generate and, and, and how we spread that out over time. Do I need to understand the cognitive tasks in the analysis phase? Um, or can I just rely on using the behavioral tasks, those things that we can observe? I can't observe your thinking, but so if I can observe you doing the performance or you telling me how you do the performance, I can wait until after design, when we get in the development phase to go after what are the thinking tasks? You know, Timothy, what are you doing? What are you thinking before you do that task, while you're doing that task and after you do that task? Because that's, what we need the learners to understand is how to think about the work that they're doing. And this is some of the most difficult data to get. But I can defer getting that cognitive task data until my development phase in a kind of a traditional ADI approach, rather than in the analysis phase. I just need to anchor my performance with these are the behavioral tasks. They do this, they do this, they do this. What are they thinking? I don't know yet, but I'll find that out later on in the project because we have to package content that teaches people how to think about their performance um, so that they do it better, faster, and cheaper. Uh, this, this, I'll go go through this this little model here. This is just these are all the variables of performance. So when I'm thinking about um, uh, Gap analysis, and if I'm prodding people, if they need to be prodded a little bit, these are the these are the aspects of performance, the enablers. There's the human, there's the awareness, knowledge, and skills, but there's all these other things, and there's these environmental enablers as well. Um, so we want to really look at all all of that, um, and then. And then that analysis, then when we talk to our clients and they say, well, wait a minute, you're, you know, what they don't like is that, well, wait a minute, you're, you're the learning people. Aren't you going to help me? Well, learning isn't going to help you actually, but you need to look at some of the other things. So if we've determined that your tools and equipment that your people are using are faulty and maybe you, the client needs to go work on the people that provide the tools and equipment to your people in your processes and get those squared away or whatever else there could be because we might handle the training and development or the learning and development or the instruction, but we don't do everything. We need to collaborate with other people in the quality organization, in the IT world or whatever, to make sure that people get the enablers that they need in order to be able to perform in the processes. And, and this, sometimes it's the things that the master performers have figured out and the novice performers have not. Anyway, um, I'll stop sharing now. Questions, comments, concerns? I'll ask a question. So um, some of our learners have a problem that the of practice that they're investigating that is a little bit different than somebody isn't producing a particular kind of output. So for example, a couple of people are looking at organizations in which at least the presenting, what I call the presenting problem, right? The management says we have too much turnover. Yeah. Okay. So this is happening all over, right? And, and we hear about it all over. Teachers are leaving uh, en masse, right? So there's a lot of yeah. turnover among teachers. Some other people work in healthcare related fields. There's too much turnover. Why is that happening? Well, you can't go back and say, well, that person 
needs to learn something or they're not meeting the standard. No, they, they left the job. Now, there probably is some, there could be some performance or something that could be fixed in there that might be able to lower the turnover. Right? Yeah, I would say yeah. when I've when I've had dealt with this many times over the past sure. four decades, and of course, then the question is, so we really need to train your supervisors who are driving people away. You know, what does your exit interview show you? Why are people leaving? Are they making more money down the street, two doors down? They're making $5 more an hour, and that's why they're leaving? You know, training isn't going to fix that. Recruiting differently isn't going to fix that. Changing your compensation system might be part of the solution set to address this issue. But what are the other needs that people are looking for that, that you know, so we need to really dig into the data that shows that. So it might be that, you know, so what in the systems view here, we've got an issue, an opportunity or a problem. What do we know about that? What can we articulate? But what data do we have about that? What data can we collect about that? So people are leaving. That's that's a symptom. So what are the root causes of them leaving and how do we go and address that? Maybe it's different supervisory training. Maybe it's, you know, and if the company says, no, we're not going to give everybody raises, we're just going to deal with it. Well, then we have to prepare our system for that churn of people coming and leaving and deal with that and the costs about that. But that's a business decision that's above our pay grade, and we can only help people do those kinds of things. But so when clients come to you and look for, you know, what kind of a solution, I don't know, you know, if they would have come to me and said, we've got all this turnover and help me train that away. Well, training... (laughs) It, it sometimes it is. I mean, I did a work for Bank of America back in the late 1990s, and and they had seven different sets of curricula because of all the mergers of all the banks. That's how they got so big. And the maintenance on those seven sets of curricula was killing them. And so my client said, you know, we need to have you guy come in and work with us and boil all these seven sets of curricula down to one, because that's all we can afford. And so we did that, but because I brought, changed their orientation into performance rather than a bunch of topics, topics with a bunch of face validity for tellers. Oh, tellers need to, oh yeah, they need to understand this, they need to understand that. But none of it taught them how to apply any of that to do their job. So I switched everything around and they dropped turnover by 35%. Because people were now trained to do the jobs and the exit interviews, which used to say, no one taught me how to do my job. I'm out of here. And and so once you get people comfortable in their performance, then you're looking at, you know, all the other variables, all the other factors, all the hygiene factors of of work. We, you know, knowledge and skills is just one part of it. And so we can begin to use our ability to go in and. And but so my point on all of this is that if you're asked to do training or learning or or instruction and you go in and you find out that the situation is such that we're not going to solve anything with new instruction, new learning. And so I have to have a way to talk to my clients about that. So I talk to them about that before I do the analysis. This is the kind of stuff I would bring back potentially. We'll see what happens. You have to trust the data. Don't send me, you know, don't make me go find people to work with. You handpick the people I'm going to work with. This is part of the collaborative effort. You're the client, you're the stakeholders. Give me your best people to work with. Oh yeah, that hurts. Short-term pain for long-term gain, but I'll try to leverage what they know and package it so that I can get other people to know things better, faster, and cheaper. Um, and so their learning curve, their performance curve is shortened and, and they're more productive more quickly. Yeah, I want to highlight something really important there that you do is you're asking them to find the great performers. Yeah. So that's, that's really- That's what Gilbert, Gilbert called them exemplars. Yeah. But my clients at Motorola in 1981 said, Guy, we hate that word. That's a $3 college word. And I said, how about master performers? I did not realize- and I found almost 40 years later, from the day I switched from exemplars to master performers, 40 years later, I found in my metal file cabinets an article by Dale Brethauer that talked about master performers. And I had not realized where I'd gotten that word from, that phrase from. But um, yeah, so finding those top people. So garbage in, garbage out, good stuff in, good stuff out. 
You get your best people in this thing who will tap into what they know, will repackage it so we can get other people to know what the master top performers, you know, and don't, don't call them master performers if that's not the language your client uses, right? You know, so always speak in the language of your clients, change all this training, learning uh, language uh, to something that's more familiar internally to your organization, whether you're a merchandising organization or a manufacturing organization, look for language that you can translate because you don't need your clients to learn, you know, your jargon. Um, you need to learn theirs. Yeah, and, and I think another really important point when you ask them for that is if they can't find anybody who's a master performer, if nobody's doing the job well, then you have some other questions to ask. Like, yeah, are, are your goals even realistic? You know, are you looking for something that's right? Well, I mean, so what's the nature of what brought you into this thing? So I had uh, clients in, in the mid 80s, Alcoa, and they wanted to cast an ingot of alumina in midair and use gravitational forces, magnetic forces to hold that molten alumina in air, in an ingot, in a, like a bar, a candy bar, in midair. And they said, you know, because they'd seen my, me do my projects for them. And they said, well, you know, what if what if we don't have a master performer? And I said, well, then, then you'll be experimenting your way to this. You won't be able to make, you know, kind of a quantum leap. And I said, so what is it you want to do? And they explained this, this. And I said, well, who is the expert? They said, there's a professor in Scotland that knows all about this. Well, then you're going to have to work with them. But when, so when you're looking at uh, improving performance to levels already achieved, that's one thing because we know it's not theoretical. It can be done. What are they doing? How are they doing it? How are they thinking about it? That's what we we're trying to elicit and package. But then when you're just trying to do appreciative inquiry, let's just improve. We're doing fine. Let's just improve for improvement's sake because that's always good. Continuous improvement. And, and so we need to, that's more difficult because we don't know that it has been done for sure. We're hoping that we can get it improved, but we have to you know, run some experiments and do things a little bit differently and see. And of course, you know, every time you're messing around with changing people's processes and things like that, there's a lot of legal ease, there's contractual stuff, there's government regulatory things like that. So one has to be kind of careful when you're doing that, which means you really need to collaborate with a lot of the stakeholders and they need to give you the right uh, things. So one of the things about, you know, innovation, uh, back in World War II, there was the skunk works that was used. And when people are trying to make massive improvements, one of the theories, one of the things I learned back in the 80s was that you dedicated a group and a space to do that improvement work. You don't mess with current operations or whatever and try to make improvements on the fly. So depending on your situation and your client's situation and they want to make an improvement, you may need to carve off some of their operations and experiment over there and do it in a controlled manner so you're not doing damage to your, you know, your customers or your, your reputation, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great point. Uh, so fellow learners here, anybody have questions or want to talk through, through your uh, project with Guy? You have a consultant in-house. Yeah, I just had a quick comment. Um, that, that, that process you talked about with, you know, instead of working through the process for a level that's already somewhat been achieved that you can refer to when you're trying to innovate, wouldn't then that also snowball into, okay, now the process is taking longer because you're experimenting. Okay. I don't want it anymore. Yeah. It's less predictable. Right. Don't you like fall into that, like kind of trap again, where like we want to be fast, but then you want innovation, but innovation isn't fast. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, exactly. That's, you know, we, everybody wants everything faster. And, you know, today and the, you know, the fast moving nature of the 2020s. Yeah, people were talking about like that back in the 1980s. So, so everybody is always wanting things to go faster, better, faster and cheaper. And when you're innovating, when you don't, when you can't say that, hey, Timothy's doing this level of this job at 98, guy is working at 68. I mean, let's 30 per points here. We can get Guy to improve much better. We know it's possible. So, 
So, but that, and that takes some time. That's not, you know, instant, but, but when we want to improve Timothy's performance from 98 to 128, just because we think that's be a great idea, it'd be so good for the bottom line, blah, blah, blah. What can we do to do that? Well, that's when, you know, marketing groups get involved and design engineering groups get involved to redesign processes to make something go better, faster, and cheaper. And when we're when we're experimenting, you know, a lot of the times I would I would think that when our clients need to experiment to make improvements, learning is an after fact. Because we now we figured that out. Now we need to teach everybody else how to do it the newfangled way. And so we can package that, but we can't be as predictive. Uh, in, you know, when will we get to the various milestones in our projects? Because that experimenting might, we might have to do, you know, 10 experiments or a thousand to figure out, you know, that way really works and is conducive to, you know, the regulatory requirements and whatever else. So there's a lot of moving pieces when we're doing improvements. And, you know, so we're either dealing with current state performance that's not adequate and we're trying to improve that. Or we want to go into some new greenfield area, which is similar in that if we want to go and create a brand new product line, we've never done that before. We're going to set it all up. We're going to, you know, we got to train people to do their jobs and all of that. Well, you know, we can figure that out, but that's going to take a little bit longer too, because we're not looking at something that already exists and we're not tweaking for improvement, something that already exists. We're building it from scratch. And some of the thought leaders at uh, NSPI, ISPI back in the day used to complain that we too often painted ourselves as if we were repairmen and we can do improvements, not just fix things, but we can do appreciative inquiry kinds of things to improve things. And we can do greenfield operations and take what we know about performance and learning and take that into these three, you know, not just fixing things, but these other uh, areas where we can do our work. Great question, Sean. Anybody else? Yes, I have a question. Go. Okay, so I am. I'm in a. Um, I'm doing my needs assessment at a school, and so the within a school, you kind of have to do quick change because of like we only have 180 days to see like to get the improvement that we want. Yeah. And so I find it that teachers are either stuck in their ways, they want to continue to do what they've been doing, how they've doing it, you know, that and then two they have they already have a lot of other things going on so adding one more thing to the plate it seems that you're not going to get the best response or you know you're not going to get a hundred percent from them to know if what you're doing or what you're putting in place is actually working so what like what yeah. steps can I take to to try to avoid that or like kind of mend that because a lot of the teachers are older and they're like they're seasoned and they're just this is how I'm going to do it. And this is why I'm going to do it this way. Like, Yeah, I, this is, you know, so this is not unique to teachers. So just so you know, um, this is true of, of the world in general. You know, we reach a certain level of competency, each of us, and then somebody comes along with the change initiative and wants to change things. And we're not too sure that we're going to be competent in the next iteration. So we resist that. Now, sometimes resistance is good because the changes were stupid and should have never been put in place and blah, blah, blah. So there's, you know, so when people resist, sometimes there's a good reason for it. And sometimes there's not such, not such a good reason for it. But um, so, yeah, when you're in a short cycle situation, you need to work with people about the change. And the the difficult thing is creating the ownership. So when I do analysis or design and development, I never see myself as the lead, even though I am. Um, I try to lead the team, which is usually with my clients' people in it and not my people in it. 
I'm leading the team and I need them to take ownership of this. I want them to own the problem statement that we've articulated, whatever manner it was, the investigation of the solutions, the possible solutions to determine what the pros and cons are and to prioritize them and look at the cost benefit analysis and all that stuff. So I need them to own it. When we when we do analysis and we go around and talk to a person and then we talk to another person, we talk to another person, we talk to another person, and person three says something totally different than person one, we can't reconcile that stuff. So my preference in working with teams of people is to get them all in a group in a room. And and whether that's virtually nowadays or not, um, that's ideal, not always feasible to get people in a room so that they can work in synchronously synchronously on something rather than asynchronously where i talked to person three and they said something totally opposite of person one that was two days ago now what do i do and i can't get them to talk about it to decide that it's really just uh semantics <laughs> that's the issue it's the same thing they just talk about it so differently that and it's it's thrown me because i don't know that world myself so uh so when you're going around to person to person to person individually, you have to plan on going a, around that again and again, probably, probably three passes with not maybe everybody, with, but with most of the people. If you bring people into a room, you can probably negotiate things and get things resolved immediately, not everything, but more things and make better progress. So part of it in the method is do I do things you know individually one on one or am I working with a group of people who are my sponsors? Um, and sometimes we do these projects and they're just exercises just so we get a little bit of a feel for it. So don't take it to heart if people reject what it is you produced because you're under a timeline and you've got to produce something and they weren't going to change anyway and the whole project was not set up in order to, you know, when I work with clients, I say, you know, I can develop the training and I can help you, you client with the transfer because you own transfer, not me. I mean, your people go, hey, we don't want to take it. That's a transfer issue. That's not mine. That's yours. They're in your chain of command, not mine. You're the stakeholder. I'm the supplier. I'm trying to help you because you've got something at stake here. And how can we begin to address this and get your people to do this? Do you need to mandate it? and force everybody to do this? Do you need to set up some demo projects so that people who take this can shine and show what they know and they can do it so much better and we bring everybody along that way? Do we have the time to do that? Or is there a deadline like, you know, day after tomorrow, this has to be done and otherwise we shut the place down? Well, so push comes to shut. So we need to look at all of the variables about our projects and we really need them to to be a servant to our clients and not, you know, we bring a certain expertise, but they know their world and we don't know that. And we, that's why we need to collaborate. We bring something that they don't have. We can bring that to them. That doesn't make us extra special and, and the, all knowledgeable about everything because we can come up with a good idea that some people might in the room might think is a good idea, but others might say, well, there's three good reasons why that's a bad idea, guy, and they can explain it to the whole room, and then we can move on with it. But but the issue of of people being stuck in their ways and not wanting to change and all that stuff, that's that's not unique to any project in any environment, education or enterprise. People resist change because they don't know if this is a silly change, a stupid change or good change. They don't know whether they're gonna be able to master this in time for their own ego needs. Um, and so we've gotta be conscious of all of that as we're working with groups and trying to get them to change. And one of the things I learned from Neil Rackham was that we often try to do too much in our programs and we should narrow what we do and maybe you know do more practice exercises on the one thing that we try to teach things rather than trying to teach people 12 things. So when we're dealing with uh, asking people to make changes, we'd be better off making uh, most of the time, not all the time, slight incremental changes to people and letting them own that change in their own trajectory from the beginning to the end of that and being responsible for that. So, it, it, you know, we have to kind of read the room, understand the culture of what we're dealing with, what these people are like, 
Um, is there one culture? Is there many cultures? Um, and, and how do we deal with that? But we have to work with our clients because they we're doing this for them, not for us. They own it. We can produce it. We can help them with transfer into it. We can help them measure the performance. But this is their import performance that we're trying to impact. And they need to have the, get their hands dirty in the effort as well. They shouldn't be using us just to get a project done and they don't really care about it. Well, if that's your case, you need to recognize as soon as possible not to take it to heart, just go through it, get it done and move on. Because life is like that sometimes and you're going to be working with projects that are not really valuable. It's political, you know, and you've got to decide, is this the hill I die on? Do I resist this? Do I say, well, I'm not doing that. Or do I just do it, get it over with and get onto something where I can maybe find something more meaningful to help my clients with? I want to emphasize something really great that you said, and then I'm going to get to a couple of questions, Guy. But I think um, often I have found that just bringing people together is part of the solution. And, you know, you get people who are resisting change and you get some of those people in a room and you say, hey, you know, Guy, you're the expert at this. You've been doing this forever. And I can imagine that it'd be hard for us to come in and tell you now that there's some new approach that we're going to be asking you to do. So how do you feel about that guy? You know, and, and you know, make those people feel good rather than, because you're saying like, if they resist, they're probably, it's they, they have some ego in it. So let's use their ego. Let's say, you know, well, you know, guy, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? Would this work? What, what aspects of it do you like? What aspects do you, th do you think don't work? Um, or, you know, often people don't want to, take on something new because they actually don't have the time. And, right. and I think you really have to hear that too, because I think, you know, a lot of you are in education, being in higher ed, they keep piling stuff on, on those of us who are teachers, professors, or whatever. So now we want you to do X and Y, and now we want you to measure this. And now we want you to hand in this report. And now we want you to do this. And it's like, whoa, whoa wait a minute, like it gets to a point that there's only so many hours in a day. And if you want me to do this, then tell me what, to then drop. tell me what I can take off my list of things. Yeah. But I think that's the kind of thing that you have to get out in the process, very important process that you describe about that facilitation to try to get people to be honest if they're resisting it. So uh, yeah. Tim, Timothy, you had your hand up. And you're on mute. Yeah, Timothy, we can't hear you. Oh, no, I, I gave a, no, I had given a clap. Oh, um, <laughs> so my was, oh uh, sorry. Stop. Got you. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, I, I was going to say that um, a lot of times, when I find myself in a situation where I'm dealing with a group that I feel may be resistant to an adjustment or a change, um, I've always found it very helpful to, to lead with data because um, it's very difficult to refute concrete information as opposed to it coming across as, this is what I feel you should be doing as opposed to this is what we should be doing. Um, and, just, and just having, sorry, that's my daughter. Um, well, sorry, one sec. Don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, well, I guess she's doing it immediately. Okay. So we, we need more help. That's good. Uh, uh, um, so you know that 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 kind of thing um kind of helps a lot with me. And I think also um when you're working in like a school community, it's also important to understand the nuance within your staff, like, like you may have a generalized culture of your building, but within that building, there are pockets of differing thoughts and opinions. And as like a school leader, I think it's very important to understand those individual components, because you may have to present something to one group one way and another group a completely different way. Some people you're gonna have to mandate, like you kind of talked about, some people you can have that conversation and they're early adopters. Sometimes you get those early adopters and people can see the benefit of what you're trying 
to impart. And then they say, oh, well, I see from this colleague that it's working. Maybe I'll try it now. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Um, yeah, and if you build a champion out of a colleague that, that was an early ad- adapter and they did it, right now you can use them as a champion and, and have them as part of their job, more work for them, is to go around and tell everybody, you know, about it. Right. And I've had clients do that with a new methodology. I did work at General Motors and I was uh, installing my instructional design methodologies, which were very different from from how General Motors had always done the work and they'd never done it one way, a a variety of ways, but they were trying to get down to one way to do the work. And they had their clients who were very skeptical because you're going to do this analysis. You know, what's up with that? Because we hate that, we think. And, And so we did it. And then we got some champions in the client world in General Motors, the, the GM university would take these people around to the new clients, the new prospects to talk about, yeah, we're going to do this project with you, but it's going to be done differently. And don't believe us here. Talk to somebody from, you know, the real world, not in the learning and development world about, about this. So finding champions can, can be very helpful, but I think that, yeah, data, data is important, um, but you've got to be careful because data is not necessarily always believable. So, the sources of the, so v- valid data is one thing. Credible is much better because when I can believe the data, because I understand your sources for it. I had a, a, a client at manufacturing at Motorola that I had put, I always put the names of the people that I worked with on my analysis report, on my design document. Well, I had this head of manufacturing throw my binder across the room, a three ring binder, paper went everywhere. This was back in 1981. And because I had the wrong name on it. So I had good valid data, but it wasn't credible. And the people that looked at it afterwards, after that big display of throwing my binder across the room, the next day people came back to me and said, this was good data that I had here. But yeah, there were two people on there that their names just triggered this person. He went berserk and threw it across the room. So that, that's when I learned to basically have my clients handpick my sources. Um, that was very, very uh, eye-opening for me to do this. But but back to change and all that stuff. So yeah, lead, I think the data can help. But then, you know, you need to tap into people's emotional states as well about this because this change might be, you know, if everybody is stressed because they're so busy and now you're asking them to take on something new, you know, that's, that's you know, you can have data on that, but it's better to have people talk about, you know, especially if they went through it and found it beneficial and it was a time saver. So it was an investment up front with a return that was worthy of their investment and try to get people to talk about that. So we're always dealing with people and we're always gathering data, you know, generally from people, not always, but, but so there's this credibility issue and, and how we work as a facilitator, you know, sometimes we're facilitators in the stand-up session in front of a room. Sometimes we're quietly facilitating our projects and the processes when we're doing meetings with clients and all of that. So we, you know, it's dealing with people and that's, you know, difficult because we're not always the same day to day. We change day to day. So we have a couple of minutes. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Any other questions or anybody want to run, run any, something about their project by Guy? I I had a question. So Guy, would you um, discourage us from using anonymous surveys? Uh, From using surveys for doing? Anonymous surveys, you know, where people don't have to put their names. As because if you talk about credibility, yeah, I you know so so I don't I don't think that I would use a survey as my single source for data. I may use it to confirm data found other ways, or you know I would have done the survey first or second or whatever. But but I wouldn't just rely on surveys. And depending on what the, I'm surveying, if it's things that I feel that people would be hesitant to speak freely about because of the nature of the questions and whatever, then I would make them anonymous. Um, But, and and allow people to put their name to it too, because um, 
I just feel that the data is more credible when people put their name to it rather than being a bunch of anonymous comments. Um, wow. But but the anonymous comments can be can provide you with some insight as well. So I think it's always you're always should be looking for a mix. You know, we're always busy. We're always under the gun time wise. And so we can't, you know, do a survey uh, this way and focus group that way and individual interviews and observations. But back to Allison Rosette and learning how to do this stuff fast. So one of the things I would do, my clients always like me to go observe the target audiences that I was addressing. I didn't always feel I needed to. So I might spend one day on site following people around, getting a sense for what their day looks like. Then I would go into a two or three day analysis meeting and generate the performance and the knowledge and skill data. And then I'd get on with my project. Um, simply because, and, and again, because I knew that I was, there are certain data that I'm going to need eventually, but I don't need them until my design phase or my development phase. And so I'm deliberately deferring some of the details that I could get now. And in my analysis phase, somebody might give me one of those details that I was planning on getting later, but I got it now. So I would put it on the flip chart easel and I would tell groups that, I'm capturing this now because it came up, but I don't really want this level of detail or the thinking of what you're doing. I really want to know what are the things that we could observe and write down, not, you know, the thinking that's going on behind all that stuff. But if you gave me something, well, you always have to be looking out for this. I'll write it down because we've got it. But but so pushing things out, um, making that uh, understandable, um, having, working with real people, never changing their words. Back when I first started, we used to change, you know, we used to talk in verb, noun, noun, verb, you know, phrases, you know, reports generated, uh, presentations made. None of my clients ever talked like that. So I quit using that, that pattern uh, because some thought it was good and the people that I learned from thought it was good. And that's something you should always do. And I quit doing that because I wanted my clients to recognize their words and what I captured. And so I tried to capture it as verbatim as possible and not translate anything. And then I'd have people that I work with that always wanted to edit and clean up the language and the words. And so it would, you know, read more smoothly. And I'd say, well, no, this is what they said. If that person reads this, they're going to go, well, I said something like that, but that's not what I said. I don't need people doing that. I need to capture what they have to say so that this is their voices that I'm facilitating and capturing and facilitating a project and going to build content based not what on what I know, but on what you know and me extracting it and organizing it and putting it in a in a form and fashion that leads to learning. Um, but but that's but that's tricky. Great. Thank you. We are- we are kind of at time, unless somebody has one short last word or important question. Okay, well, Guy, uh, thank you ever so much. You have a, a lot of really important insights. They're they're about to, you know, be uh, choosing all their methodologies and uh, actually getting into doing their their investigations. So. Uh, I think you've made some really important points about how important it is to facilitate and get things in the in the words and the expertise and the credibility of those who are the performers. So we will we'll remember that. And if you could shoot me your PowerPoint, then I'll post it in the course room. I'll do that. And if anybody wants to follow up with me on specific questions about your specific projects, I'll be you know happy to uh, continue the dialogue with you in that regard. Uh, right. But uh, thank you for having me, and I will send this uh, that PowerPoint show over to you, Diane, uh, right after this, and uh, you can distribute it to everybody. Thank you, and I'll send you a recording of this, too. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good to see everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye.